I'm Spencer Mazik and joining me now for an inside perspective into SoftBank's $20 billion acquisition of Sprint Nextel is Robert Townsend. He is the co-chair of the global M&A practice group at Morrison and Forrester. The firm represents SoftBank in this deal. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Spencer. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Robert, obviously SoftBank views this deal as a huge growth opportunity, but how so? What's the acquisition strategy here? You know, Sprint has done a terrific job in Japan where they acquired the Vodafone Japan cell phone business several years ago. At the time they acquired it, it was a distant number three competitor in Japan to NTT Docomo and KDDI, and they have grown that business in Japan now to the point where they're the number two wireless carrier in Japan. They have a similar strategy in mind here in the U.S., uh, mobile telephony and mobile internet data-based business, where we find that we have here, like they used to have in Japan, two dominant carriers, uh, ATT and Verizon, and with Sprint a number three in the market and uh, T-Mobile number four. So the plan here is similar to the plan in Japan. They want to execute, they want to bring new technology, new services to customers and quickly make gains on the, the dominant carriers in the market and, and find themselves in their company very soon. Well, and specifically, the deal allows Sprint to fund a faster expansion of its 4G wireless network, to pay down some of its debt, and to make some of its own acquisitions. So when do you guys expect the deal to close? We expect it to close in the middle of 2013. Before we can close, we're going to need to get regulatory approval from a variety of government agencies here in the United States and secure the approval of the Sprint shareholders, both of which we think will happen more or less around June of next year. Yeah, I was going to ask you, do you foresee any regulatory issues by way of antitrust or even national security in this case? We don't, Spencer. You know, this is a very pro-competitive transaction. Uh, SoftBank is bringing new capital to Sprint, as you mentioned earlier, that will allow them to further build out their network, deploy new services, new products for customers. So we think from an antitrust standpoint, this is going to be very favorably received. And from a regulatory standpoint with respect to government issues regarding national security and the FCC approval process, we think they too will, will welcome, welcome this transaction warmly. You know, there have been some questions about the fact that Huawei is a supplier of SoftBank in Japan. Yes, exactly. That, yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. You know, both... Um, Dan Hess, the uh, CEO of, of Sprint, and uh, Masayoshi Son, the, the head of SoftBank, had made it clear that they respect the U.S. government's view on the use of foreign suppliers, and they'll work cooperatively with the U.S. government to meet whatever requirements there are. Okay, and so this isn't the first overseas investment for SoftBank, but it's certainly its largest foreign bet, right? It is. It's like a reintroduction of SoftBank to the U.S. market to some extent. They're very active here in, in the late 90s, early 2000 in the internet sector, and, and they have since um, really developed their business in Japan and Asia. And as they look to expand outside Japan, which is a rather um, stable market uh, in terms of growth at least, they decided to, uh, to invest in the United States after, after having considered many other options and looking at this as a very fertile opportunity for them. Well, and isn't this also the biggest outbound Japanese acquisition in at least a decade? You know, actually, Spencer, this is the largest uh, outbound acquisition from Japan in history, and we believe wow. it's actually the largest outbound investment from Asia ever as well. Well, and I'm sure you're very much aware of this, but according to Bloomberg Business Week, Japanese companies have announced $96 billion in foreign takeovers so far this year, which has exceeded last year's record of $88 billion. So what's going on here, Robert? What, why are we now seeing so many foreign acquisitions coming out of Japan? You know, as I look at it, the question for me is what took so long to some extent, <laughs> because what you see in Japan is the perfect combination of factors that typically do drive mergers and acquisitions. Um, first of all, they have a great deal of uh, cash on the balance sheets of strategic buyers. They also have cheap capital in the form of lending rates there being uh, relatively low and banks being willing to lend. But also they have a fairly stable, slow-growing economy at this point. So major Japanese companies are now looking to uh, invest overseas where they can participate in growth outside of Japan. And in doing that, they have the advantage of a very high-valued yen, so it makes foreign investment even less expensive. 
I'm not sure why it took Japanese executives this long to get around to deploying capital outside of Japan, but they certainly are confident in doing that now. Well, and isn't your firm uniquely positioned to handle a lot of those M&A transactions coming out of Japan by virtue of its presence there in the country? So, well, thank you for asking. Yes, we are by <laughs> far the largest foreign law firm in Japan. We're very proud of our office there. We have a very strong practice representing both Japanese and foreign companies in their activities in Japan, but also coming from Japan elsewhere in the world. It's, it's really part of our larger Asian practice. We have a very large practice in China as well. And when you add that to our presence in California, uh, we think of ourselves as the leading law firm in both California and the Pacific using a old term. We think we're the, the leading pack rim law firm. And then when you combine that with our strengths in the technology sector, it really is a, a very attractive offering to clients who are looking to do cross-border investments uh, in technology and also a variety of other industries, including healthcare. What, how many attorneys there in Japan, though, just so that we know? We have about 150 lawyers in our Tokyo office, and that's comprised of both a large number of U.S. attorneys who are there largely servicing the need of, uh, needs of Japanese clients, uh, and also a very large uh, complement of Japanese lawyers known as Bengoshi in Japan. Well, and so back to Soft, SoftBank for just a second. Aside from the Sprint deal, what other billion dollar acquisitions have you handled for SoftBank just this year alone? Well, they did another acquisition in the middle of the SoftBank deal, which kept all of our lives interesting. They acquired another company called eAccess, which was a Japanese uh, telecommunication wireless company that was a uh, deal that was $2 billion in magnitude and uh, did that in the midst of our negotiations with Sprint. So it uh, kept all of us on our toes and made for, uh, for an interesting uh, process. So Robert, overall your M&A team seems to be having a very good year. What do you attribute to this success, especially when other firms don't seem to be faring as well this year? Well, you know, Spencer, I think it's a matter of being in the right place at the right time. We, uh, we have historically uh, invested in developing a, a cross-border practice where we're very well positioned in Asia, as I mentioned earlier. We're very well positioned in the West Coast of the United States and in markets like New York as well. And what we have seen is a, is a real coming to fruition of that strategy because we have the geographic strengths. And then that's really complemented by our strengths in technology and the life science sectors where we have both the M&A expertise as well as the other areas required to do deals in those industries very well, such as intellectual property, uh, patents, um, commercial licensing. And so we're able to help clients really understand and assess target companies and then put in place the agreements to make sure that they get the benefit of the bargain they're seeking and really have uh, themselves positioned to succeed in executing on their acquisitions, acquisition strategies going forward. Well, we wish you continued success, Robert. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. For more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.